Okay, it looks like we're live. Kevin, can you hear us now? Kevin, can you hear us? Yes, I can see you, but again, I cannot hear you. Um, and my, my system is working fine because I had I tested it earlier this morning. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Okay, Kathleen, can you hear us? Hey, Todd. Hello, can you hear us? Hi, yeah, it's Kathleen Steen. I'm, I'm here. Okay, wonderful. I think we, had about, we had three conversations going on on the same thing. Um, the other teachers are all in another conversation that I've just been in, so I had to close that down to get your call. You know okay. what I mean? can, you, can you go back to that other conversation and tell them to join the new invite? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> all right, thanks, Kathleen. No problem. <laughs> I don't know why I can't. Well, are you hearing me now, Todd? Yeah, I can hear you, Kevin. Oh, I'm still not hearing you. Pardon me? We're waiting for them to accept the invite. I don't know what to do about Kevin there. Yeah, and do you have his phone number? Kevin. He's playing with his computer. There we go. Hey, Todd, did it. So I think they've just come out of that one, so they'll be joining what? this one. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. No problem. I've just lost all my A-level students, so they've got a quick maths tutorial. They'll be back in 15 minutes. That's so. fine. Kevin, are you able to hear us? Hi, Leonora. Hi there. Hey. How are you doing? Okay. How are you guys doing? Doing okay. better. Let me play with this band thing. Yeah, play with the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, we're waiting for just a couple more classrooms to join on. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. That's better. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Let's see if that's better. Mm. Leonora, is that working better for you? Uh, still a little bit of sticking, but it's doing better. Okay. That may be as good as you're going to be able to get. Probably, probably. 
Okay. Okay. Well, I'm just joining today as a practice run because our my kids will be in tomorrow. Okay, that's fine. Oh. Kathleen, do you have students today, or oh, you, you just have two levels left. Yeah, my, mine have Bring got like, all a math stuff exam, so they're coming in about yeah, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then Verity's joining you tomorrow with her year 12 marine biologists. So you've got my year 13s who were watching you last year and they're kind of saying, oh, we've got more questions. In fact, they wanted to, they said, do you realize we could get on a plane and be there before the lesson ends? And I said, no, we are not flying over there. <laughs> we are not allowed. Oh, I've lost you, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Honey, there. Hello, is this Laura? Mm, the one by the woodwork people. Okay. Okay. Bye. Somebody lost the picture. You're in the group. Stick them in the envelope if anything. Okay, Karen, are you there? So I see Leonora, I see Karen, I see Kathleen. Can you guys hear me? Hello, I'm back. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Kathleen, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. All right. Karen, can you hear me? All right, Karen's still joining us. Everyone just hold on for a few minutes while we get all the teachers online. So far we have four different okay. classrooms. I'm going to try and get rid of that other me. All right, guys. Enjoy your birthday. Okay, Kevin, are you able to hear us now? Wendy? All right, Karen, I see that you joined. Are you able to hear us? Yes, hi, morning, Todd. Oh, Kevin, there you are. Yes, I'm hearing you now. Wonderful. Okay. Excellent. So just hang tight there for a couple minutes, Kevin. We have two more people that are still trying to get their audio up and going. Okay, sir. Wonderful. Rampart. Yeah. Both sides. Quicker too.
Okay, so all of the teachers right now, if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, there's a bunch of icons. The very top one says chat. If you click on that, it'll give you a chat bar on the right-hand, or it's a, it'll be on the right-hand side of your screen, and we can talk to each other without making everyone hear you. Okay, we're going to start. Um, I am not sure about that. I have one right here. I have an extra one. The other one. Yep. It should. We did it with his brother. Oh, I mean, I don't know. Link to the um, should I get anything like that? Yeah, so it'll be the no, it'll be the latest one that I just sent. I'll tell you what, right there with it. Right. Do you want to do that now? Because we're okay. Good morning. Oh, Michael. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. Can you hear me? Okay, everybody, we are going to get started right now. Wave to me if you can hear me. Awesome. Okay, so uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, right now, I see we have Michael Hunt online uh, at Spot Bay. We've got Leonora, who is doing a test run today. We have Kathleen from Cayman Prep. Um, Aaron is still not quite on yet. We've got Kevin, uh, who is here from uh, Bot Bay, and I, now I see Andy. Hi, Andy. Andy, uh, can you hear me, Andy? Apparently, anyway, we are going to get started right now. So you decide, for example, um, classroom, you can hit the mute button on your uh, camera or on your little windows, then we're not going to hear all of your classrooms talking right now. And when you're ready to talk, you can unmute your, your control. Thank you. Okay, so um, here's the things that we're going to do today. The Google Hangout happening and put on it. Uh, video, the first thing, uh, we're going to go over the current status of the Group for Moon project and what's been going on over the last week here on Little Cayman and out on the, the West End where the uh, Grouper spawning aggregation site is. Um, I'm going to introduce you to a few of the scientists that are spearheading the project. Uh, they're going to share some of the scientific uh, equipment and instruments that they use for this project. Um, we are going to have a couple of uh, tutorials on, on a couple of the things that they're using. 
we're going to show you a clip of the actual grouper spawning. And then at the very end, we will have time for everyone to ask questions. Does that sound all right? Yeah? OK, we're going to get started. I'm going to step out of the way really quick. And I'm going to have right here, we have uh, Bryce Simmons. And we have Christy Simmons Pattengill, and they are uh, two of the scientists that are spearheading this project. And they are now going to talk a little bit about what they've been doing so far on the project. Okay, hi everybody, uh, welcome. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what's been going on so far this year. I believe some of you uh, were involved with us last year in the project. So we do this every single year during the winter time. Uh, NASA grouper go to spawn either in January or February, and sometimes in both. And in fact, sometimes they'll even go to spawn in March as well. Um, the problem is that they, they do this spawning, usually starts right around the full moon in one of those months. And by about four or five, six, maybe even seven or eight days after the full moon, that's when the big spawning happens. That's when, when everybody spawns and then they go home back to their home reefs. But it can be a challenge sometimes to predict what month is going to be the big month? When are they going to do that spawning? And that challenge happens when the full moon in January falls somewhere around the middle of the month. So if it's around the 14th, 15th, or 16th, it's a toss-up as to whether or not the big spawning is going to happen in either January or February. Well, this year, the full moon happened on the 16th which is right in the middle of the month. And that's what we call a split moon month. And it means that you're likely to get fish spawning in either January or February, and we really can't predict what's going on. Beyond that, we think it has to do with temperature. So if January happens to be a cold month, then they're likely going to be spawning in January. Otherwise, chances are pretty good they're going to spawn in either February or maybe even March. Can you talk a little bit about why the temperature makes a difference for the grouper? Yeah, so, so we, don't, we don't exactly know why there's a sweet spot for temperature for, for, the, for the window in which spawning um, is, is optimal, but we think it has to do with the physiology of the eggs. In other words, there's an optimal temperature where when the, baby, uh, when the eggs hatch into baby grouper, they're able to grow fastest in a really small window of temperature that happens to be down here some of the coldest temperatures that the Caymans might experience. Now this year, what's the weather been like? Does anybody know? I can hear some of you, I bet, right? It, mm -hmm. Hey, anyone in Kevin's classroom, can you tell us what the temperature's been like here in the Caymans? Everybody's got the mute, mute button. Yes, hold on a moment. <laughs> Hey there. Hey, Spot Bay. Good to see you guys. Yeah, so it's freezing cold. It's been freezing cold. Yeah, it has been. You know, like the last couple of days, it's been freezing cold and really rainy, right? And lots and lots of clouds and rough weather and waves and wind. But before that, it turns out that it's been a very mild winter. And so when we got down here, we got in the water, and the water temperature in Fahrenheit was about 83, 82 or 83 degrees. That's about 5 degrees warmer than it is normally during this time of the year. It's dropping very rapidly now. So as of this morning, the water temperature was more like 78 degrees. And that's getting closer to where it needs to be. So all of this plays a role in, in ultimately when grouper decide to go to spawn. What's happened is because the water temperature has been so warm, there aren't that many grouper out there. There are certainly not the three to 4,000 fish we normally see in years past. There's maybe more like five, maybe 600 grouper that are there. Now, that's still a whole lot of grouper, right? But it's not nearly as many as we've seen in years past. So, Bryce, I'm wondering if you can tell the kids a little bit about what, or Christy, uh, what the schedule, the daily schedule has been like for all of you scientists here on the project for the last few days. Yeah, so there's about uh, 12 of us scientists and staff from the Department of Environment here on Little Cayman, and we have a pretty busy schedule. We get up early, and our first dive of the day, we meet down at the dock at about 7.30 in the morning get all of our gear on board, make sure we have all of the equipment we need, talk about our plan, who's going to do what, and then we take off from the dock and head out to the site. It takes us about 20 minutes to get from where we get on the boat to get out 
and then we moor up on the site on the on the aggregation site and everybody gets ready and we everybody jumps in and does their the jobs that they're supposed to do we do that again and we come back after we're done and then we have some food and we download all of the data we collected and then we go back out at about one o'clock and we do everything again and then we have a third dive of the day where we leave the dock at about five or five thirty depending on when sunset is we try and get to the site about a half hour before sunset for that last dive. and some of the things that we do out there we're going to show you some of the equipment, but uh, first I think we might have James uh, from the Department of Environment out on our vessel who we're going to switch to in a minute, and he's going to show us the dive boat that we've been using. All right, James, so I'm now going to um, click it so that your screen is the screen that everyone's going to be seeing. All okay, right, cool. everyone, there's James Gibb who works at the Department of the Environment. Hi there. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, yes. wonderful. So uh, I'm going to just uh, flip my camera around so I can... Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, cool. So I'm going to come back up on the dock here real quick. So I was hiding in the shade because it's really nice and sunny here. Uh, I'm used to all the cloudy weather, so I'm not used to the sun. But this here is Lucky Devil, all right? Um, this is the Southern Cross Club boat that we've been using to go out on the site. Uh, uh, two trips out of the three. Um, during the day. Now she's a lot bigger than the smaller DOE boat that we have um, out here. Uh, we use the smaller boat for the early morning trips and then we use this boat for the lunchtime and the evening trips. As you can see, there's a lot of tanks on board and there's a lot of dives here. So what we'll do is we'll come on board the boat. We'll have to mind our head here. And then Everyone will line up and uh, get their gear on their tanks. You'll see here's some gear on a tank here ready to go. All right, and here's some full tanks that people can still put uh, some gear on. Um, and then we'll all uh, sit down on these benches and we'll go out to the site. And when we're on the site, everyone will put their dive gear on. And they'll walk to the stern of the boat, to the back of the boat. They'll stand on this ledge here. And then they'll take a big leap into the water and do their dive. And when they come back, this big ladder will be in the water and they'll uh, hand their, their fins and any equipment that they may be using uh, to us on the boat and then they'll use this ladder then climb back on and then sit down with the gear and get out and then move to the front of the boat and get dry and get warm because with this cold wind happening, uh, it can be a little bit chilly when you get out of this water. So that's our, that's our big boat. And if you look across here on that other small dock there, that is the smaller boat. I don't know if you can make it out, but it's, it's, it's docked up on the, on the fishers, fishman dock uh, here at Southern Cross Club. All right. Thank you so much, James. Everyone wave to James. Goodbye, James. Bye. Bye, James. Thank you. All right. So here we are uh, back on the dock, and I'm going to introduce you guys to Steve Giddings, who is one of the scientists working on the project, and he's going to share a few of the scientific instruments that they're using here on the project. Hi, everybody. I'll show you a couple of the uh, tools that we use to do the work that we're doing out on the uh, spawning aggregation site, starting with a small pole with some other bands attached to it. And what do you suppose is on this end? There's a little sharp point. Everybody see? Everybody see that? Well, what we can do with this small spear is tag some fish by inserting some small plastic tags into their uh, into their back and the upper back of the fish. It doesn't really hurt them. You just put it on the end of that spear and put a little rubber band around the end of the tag. See that? Right there. <laughs> now that little plastic piece of the white plastic here shoots at the fish and goes just underneath the skin and holds this pink plastic tag. And the pink plastic tag drags behind the fish so we can see it anytime we want to. So we go down to the bottom and we use the other man up the pole spear and tightens it up. This is called a Hawaiian sling. When you let it go, 
It shoots the spear. I won't shoot it at the screen, but watch. It just shoots the spear gently into the upper back of the fish, and it leaves the little tag in the fish. So we tag about 100 fish out of the 2,000 that are out there. And that's one in every 20 fish has a tag. We think. And then we can go out any time and count a certain number of fish, and we'll estimate the total of population of the fish because we know we tagged 100 of them. And that's the way these tags work. That's all they are. They're little markers that we can go back and look at again. Hey, okay, let's, let's stand up and we're going to leave it. Okay, I think we've probably got a pretty good view of this. Okay. Look at this. Yeah. This weighs about, I don't know, five or six pounds. It starts by you attaching this to your scuba tank. You just strap it on your scuba tank, and then it has a bracket on top where you can clip this thing before you go in the water. And that sits on the back of your scuba tank. Anybody know what it is? Basically turns you into a boat or a submarine. You hit this on the water and press it. And this thing moves you through the water really fast. All you have to do is move your fins up and down and you can guide and direct yourself underwater by holding this button down and letting this thing pull you along. You don't even have to kick. It makes swimming very easy. It's called a, a scooter, a Pegasus scooter. So, Steve, do you think you can explain why this, the thruster is important? Why can't you just swim around while you're down there? Sometimes you can. And most of us don't use these, but there are times when you're having to carry something heavy, and it's very hard to move things through the water when you're carrying something heavy. Or just imagine trying to walk up a hill constantly, swimming into a current. You know how hard it is walking up a hill for a long period of time? Isn't it nicer if you're in a car going up a hill? Well, this turns you into basically a little car underwater or a little boat underwater, so you just don't have to work very hard at all getting where you need to go. And sometimes we go pretty long distances underwater, and uh, this sure makes it easy. And you have a limited amount of oxygen down there, so it helps you get to more places. Yeah, at the depths way. that we're diving, we only can stay down about 30 minutes or so and um, and if you're having to work really hard, you breathe a lot faster, you might only have 15 minutes to do your job. This allows you to spend a lot longer underwater, uh, at least conserve your air, so that you don't breathe your tank down uh, so fast. It gives us a lot more time underwater. That's right. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, everyone wave to Steve. Good job. Thanks for your work. Thanks for helping Bye. out. And uh, now Bryce is going to share um, some lasers that they use. Some of you may be wondering, how do the scientists measure uh, 4,000 fish that are underneath the water? They can't exactly go up and ask them, hey, how long are you? Uh, so they have a really cool tool to do that. And Bryce is going to show you what that is right now. Yeah, so first, let, let's talk about why we're doing what we're doing, just really briefly. We're, we're monitoring the spawning aggregation uh, in order to try and figure out whether or not the population of Nassau grouper is recovering. And there's two different ways that the population can recover. There can be more fish, so it's always a good thing if you have more fish, right? But the other thing that can happen is that the fish that are there can get bigger. So they may start off this big, but then they can get that big and bigger and bigger as they get older. And bigger fish are really important because bigger fish make many more eggs many more baby grouper than smaller fish do. So that's one important way that we, uh, we, we monitor how that population is recovering over time. So first of all, when we're down in the water, one of the things that we're doing is we're counting the number of fish that show up at the aggregation site. We do that both by taking down a slate with us, and this is just, just paper and a regular pencil, and it turns out regular pencils are really good at writing underwater. How come the paper doesn't fall apart under the water? This is not regular paper. This paper actually has a little bit of plastic in it, so that it doesn't disintegrate when you get it into water. But it's paper enough that you can use a regular paper to write on it. So we use this slate to write down how many fish that we see and in what areas of the spawning site we see them in. But that's not the only way we're, we keep track of the number of fish. We also use these things, and I bet a lot of you know what these are. 
It's a little underwater camera. These happen to be little GoPros, but we have lots of different kinds of underwater camera that we either take down with us, or in this case, we use this, what's called a gorilla pod, to put it down on the reef and stick it down there, and we let that record for a couple hours. Then we go back out on our, with our dive equipment and we recover it. Then we can use the video that's captured on this camera to have a second estimate of the total number of fish that are there by looking at our videos when we go back to the lab. And then the last thing that we do is we also keep track of the size of fish. And we do that with this guy right here. This kind of looks like a, a pretty space age piece of equipment, right? So this has got the camera in the middle. And then these yellow things, these are lasers. So if I can turn them on, I bet you can see the little red dot. See how, you, the, see how the, yeah, there you go. I shined you in your eyes. Don't, don't ever look into a laser, right? But it's okay because it's coming over the webcam. It's fine. So both of these yellow uh, gadgets on either side have red lasers that shoot out forward. They're perfectly parallel. They're perfectly in a straight line with each other. And what that means is right here at the very front, these are 25 centimeters apart, but if I'm shining my lasers onto something out in front of me, it doesn't matter how far away that thing is from my laser setup. Because these things are perfectly straight in line with each other, those laser dots are always 25 centimeters apart. So if I'm lasering a fish and I've got my video recording those lasers on the fish, I can then take this video back to the lab and using the fact that these two dots are 25 centimeters apart and on the side of a fish, I can estimate the actual size of that fish on my video. And so by doing that, we can shoot or laser maybe 40, maybe even 100 fish on a dive and we can go back to the lab and estimate the size of all of those fish to within a centimeter or two. And we use that information to estimate how the, how the how the fish are changing in terms of size on the aggregation through time, and that's one measure of how the population is responding or recovering. Wonderful. Okay, so um, as you can tell, we're not underwater today, and part of the reason that we're not underwater is uh, because we're having some technical issues with, with our underwater equipment. Um, the other reason is that uh, if you're here in the Caymans, you probably know that there's been some um, weather going on. We have some pretty big seas out there, uh, which would make it difficult for us to do the web chat from there today. So we will try to do that again tomorrow. I hope you guys can all join us tomorrow. Um, but uh, in lieu of being underwater, we have some footage um, of the spawning aggregation uh, from last year that we're going to share with you guys. And if you just give me one second, we'll see if we can get that to play for you. Okay, so I had a playlist saved.
Okay, and now we are back. Uh, wave up here if you can see us and, and, and everything right now. I see Cayman Prep guys. Can you, Kathleen, can you guys wave over here? There you are. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure you're all there. Uh, so now Bryce and Chris, you're going to talk a little bit about that footage that you just saw, and they're going to explain what the fish are actually doing right now. Yeah, so as Bryce explained earlier in our chat, um, this is a split moon year, so we uh, aren't seeing the numbers. It's, it's always a guessing game which moon, which month is going to be the big month in split years. It can be January, it can be February, it can be into March. Um, and this month in January does not seem to be much of a month so far anyway because the numbers are currently seeing, as Bryce said, you know, under a thousand fish, at least in the traditional site where we see them always. But as you saw in that video just now, typically we see four or five thousand altogether. So it's quite a different experience. But it's still, it's really important for us to be able to document the changes each year and to better understand what is causing the grouper to cue in on the aggregation and know when to get there. Um, so we have been doing all of the same monitoring that we've been doing every year, but in just a lot lower numbers this year. So it's good, important data that we're collecting on our, on our slates. Um, but a different experience than last year, for sure. Field work. It happens sometimes. Yeah. All right. So uh, there we shared with you guys a bunch of the different equipment that, that the scientists have been using and a lot of information about what we're doing out here. Um, and now one of the really cool things about this Google Hangout is that you will be able to ask us some questions. Um, so teachers, you can unmute uh, your, your microphones. And um, I will call on a teacher at a time and, and take some, some questions that Christy and Bryce can answer about anything that you've heard about uh, today. And while you are all unmuting, I will um, just let you guys know. You might have noticed back here uh, we have Minnie Mouse, lovely Minnie Mouse behind us. It's Minnie. It's Minnie. She's got eyelashes. Um, and uh, that might be a little odd to have a, a mini mouse, mini mouse in the field with us, but it's part of the reason that we can bring all of this field work and science and, and information from Little Cayman out to you all in your schools and to the rest of the world, anyone who's watching us online, is through a grant that we got from uh, Disney, a specific part of Disney called Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund. And they specifically fund science and education on endangered species and wildlife ecosystems that are in threat. And as you all know, Nassau Grouper is an endangered reef fish, and they have been very generous in supporting what we do so that we can get the information to you guys. And so that's why Minnie Mouse is joining us today. Awesome. Okay, so it looks like uh, Kathleen's class. Do you guys have a question for us? <laughs> yes, you do. Have you admitted Are you being yeah, shy? Yeah. Come um, on. <laughs> these guys, these guys all... They are. Come on. See you did, Tom? There you are. You go. No, I'm a teacher. You're a um, student. <laughs> so... When you actually see the spawning, do you think you'll see more fish this year than last year? Good question. <laughs> so when when a, right, so so probably it's going to be the case that next month is the big month for spawning, and we're right now we're sort of scrambling to try and uh, and put together a field team for next month. We hadn't planned on that. This I would guess that this month we'll probably see some spawning, but it's it's not going to be a lot. And I think next month is going to be uh, the big month for spawning, and and at, during that spawning event, if I were to bet money, of course you never know, right, because it's, it's biology, it's the real world, mm -hmm. animals die and they get deployed. But I, I would guess that um, there'll be many more fish this year than there were last year even, uh, because uh, two to three years ago we had a couple of large recruitment events, and what that means is that we had... Um, a bunch of young groupers show up on the reefs, and that hadn't happened in years past. So I'm guessing that starting this year, certainly by next year, we'll start to see that big pulse of young fish move into the population, and we'll get a lot more fish out there. But 
that this is also gets back to that why we do the length stuff as well. Because you might think that, mm -hmm. well, recovery in a population means that the fish are getting bigger, but it's actually, it's the opposite. If you see a lot more fish that are smaller, that means that there's new teenagers that are showing up in the population. And so we're looking for that as well. All right. Wonderful question. Um, let's go over to Kevin's class. Kevin, can we get a couple of questions? Or, well, we'll start with one question from your class. Um, you know. Yeah, ask your question. How many times in the in the winter full moves to the group respond? Okay, so the question, the question is, how many times during the winter full moon do the groupers spawn? Yeah? Okay. So usually uh, once every year, there'll be one month where most of the fish, or all of the fish, in fact, it's almost all of the fish that, that are able to reproduce, will show up, and they'll spawn uh, over the course of about three days. And what's, what's really interesting about that is that that is the total reproduction. That's all of the spawning that the species does throughout the entire year. It's just during those three to four days. And so that's why it's really important that those fish get protected during that critical period of time because that's when they spawn and they never spawn any other time. Okay. He said Wonderful. one. Do we have another question from Kevin's class? From Spot okay. A. Um, Cassandra. Do they have a special? Do the groupers have a special spot to um spawn? So the question was, do the groupers have special spots to spawn? Excellent, excellent question, Cassandra. I thought it was a special spot. Oh, do they have a special spot that they go to to spawn? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question, and yes, they, they leave their home reef where they live the rest of the year, and they all travel to a certain location, and that location here on Little Cayman happens to be out on the west end of the island. It, all throughout the Caribbean, in wherever there are spawning aggregations, and this is true for a lot of different species, not just Nassau grouper, they will pick a special spot, and the question that we're one of the questions we're trying to answer is, what is so special about that spot? Why don't they go somewhere else? And a lot of it has to do with the current and how the water moves around that location. And also that it's easy to find, we think. We think that they pick spots at the very ends of islands or out on shelf edges where the wall drops off. Because a fish can easily navigate to it, as opposed to a spot out in the middle that might not be so distinguishable. So we think those spots are so special, one, because they're easier to find, and also because the ocean currents and the, wa the way that the water moves around them helps distribute the, um, the reproductive the, um, gametes after they have been released. The big grouper, yeah. All right, excellent question. I'm going to go back over to Cayman Prep, and uh, we can take another question from you. <laughs> Um, have the spots that you guys know already, um, have they ever changed? Good question. So uh, the question was, do the spot, does the spot where the group respond change? Yeah, that's, that's actually... Like, um, have you ever a, witnessed it change or experienced it change before? You know, since we've been coming here, we haven't... Uh, they've, they've always been spawning uh, on the west end of Little Cayman. But historically, in the 80s, the big spawning aggregation was on the exact opposite side of the island, on the east end. And uh, it got fished pretty hard in the 80s, fished to the point where it wasn't really worth fishing anymore. And then for, for about 15 years or so, nobody knew about spawning aggregations, on, knew if there were any spawning aggregations on the island. And that gave the population enough time to recover and rebuild. But interestingly, when it rebuilt, in other words, when there was a lot more fish again, they started going to the west instead of the east. So they went to the exact opposite side of the island. And, and so this is actually a, a really uh, important area of research right now is to try and figure out whether or not those spawning aggregation sites can switch and what may cause them to switch. Because one of the thoughts here is based on just that, anecdotally, what, what I just described, is that when you fish an aggregation very, very hard, at some point, 
uh, you the the fish themselves will get to be such so small that they will get up and move to another spawning aggregation that's somewhere else, and so you'll lose that spawning aggregation. Not necessarily because all the fish are gone; they're almost all gone. But they've also just picked up and gone on to someplace else that has more fish. It's like going to a you know, if you're going to a party, yeah. you're gonna we want to go to the party where all the other kids are, right? So if you go to a party with just a few kids, you're gonna go and you know look for another party with more kids. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's take another question from uh, Spot Bay. Spot Bay, gotcha. Want to ask another question? Okay, Twain. Can you repeat the question for us? He wants to know. Okay, how go. Many, how many groupers uh, they are for the ones the women groupers are spawning? Can you repeat that, Kevin, for us? Um, about how many eggs when they are spawning? Okay. So the question is, how many eggs uh, are released during the spawning? Bryce? Something. Millions and millions and millions of eggs. Huge amount of eggs. More than you could possibly count in a lifetime. And, it, and it's because those big, big fish produce lots and lots of eggs. And there are thousands of them out there that are all releasing eggs at the same time. And in fact, there are so many eggs that get released that when it, on the nights of peak spawning, when most of the eggs are getting released, it's, it's difficult to see. At some point, you, you, the visibility drops to nothing because the water is so filled with eggs that it's, it's completely cloudy. And the eggs themselves are about the size of a pinhead. You can definitely see them with your eye, but they're very, very small. And that's how, uh, how those big fish can produce that many eggs, because the eggs themselves are quite small. Um, does anyone at Spot Bay, uh, do you have a guess of why it's beneficial for the fish to release so many eggs? Does anyone think they know why? Aiden. Kevin, can, can you call on someone, see if they know? Yes, Aiden. I think because, because I think the fish know that the population is dropping down, <laughs> so I think they lay more eggs because they want more food. That, that you, heard, you heard that answer? Is there, is there anyone else who has another <laughs> theory? Anybody else? Sasha? Um, I think that they want to make the population up but then go up. All right, those are great guesses. Uh, Chrissy, can you explain why they release so many? Yeah, because most of them don't live very long. Most of them um, get eaten by filter feeders or they get swept off into really deep water or um, all sorts of other hazards that are waiting for them out in the ocean. And very few of them actually live long enough to come back and actually become in a uh, little baby Nassau grouper on the reefs near shore somewhere where they can grow up to be an adult. Excellent. Excellent job. Okay, we're going to head back over to Cayman Prep and see if we have another question from the high school. Hey, guys. It looks like your camera's on mute, Cayman Prep. All right, we'll, we'll, oh, there you go. You guys have a question for us? Do you want to think about it and we can come back to you? <laughs> sure, yeah. Okay, we'll come right back to you. Let's take another question from uh, Spot Bay. Yes, um, John? Um, how do you mean? 
Okay, so the question is, how do they spawn? Okay, that's a wonderful question. Uh, we can explain that for you. So, so when they're, and I think you saw this on the video, when they when they spawn, a whole bunch of fish, maybe ten or twenty fish, will all get together, very very close, and they'll start to swim up. Often they'll, they'll swim up together, and as they're swimming up together, they're all releasing their their eggs at the same time, the gametes. And so when they swim up, they'll swim up together, and there'll be this big cloud of smoke. It's like, have you ever seen a, an old car that produces a exhaust or something? It's exactly what it looks like. It looks like the fish are smoking, but instead of smoke, it's eggs that are coming out. Oh, uh, sorry. We were having a side conversation. Okay. Uh, let's go back over to Cayman Prep. I think they're ready for a question now. All right, guys. Um, how do the groupers sense the change in currents in the water? And moon. And the cycles of the moon. Okay, so the question is how and do the, the cycles groupers, of the moon. How do the groupers sense the change in currents and the cycles of the moon? Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Good question. Well, that that is a really good question and one that we <laughs> really have an answer to, but we are trying all the time to get more evidence to help us better understand that. Of course, we can't ask them, so we don't know for sure, but we think it has a lot to do with water temperature, like Bryce said. Also, the light levels of the moon probably tell them a little bit about what time of the month it is and when it's time to start migrating towards the aggregation. Um, but there's also a lot of, of current changes that happen. We know from work we've done where we put drifters in the water, a big um, sock basically that hangs way down in the water column that moves around with the water and it, that, the top of the, the sock has a buoy that connects to the satellites and reports where it is. So we can release that drifter at the spawning site and then watch where it goes in the ocean for 45 days. And we know that on nights when they don't spawn, the currents do something very different than the nights when they do spawn. So something about the currents is cluing the grouper in to tell them what nights to, to actually do the spawning. So they're there at that spawning site for 7 to 10 days. But they don't actually spawn all seven to ten days. They only spawn two or three nights during that time. And and the the nights that they pick are are pretty specific to a couple of different, probably a lot of different environmental clues that they're picking up on. We don't really understand all that yet. All right. And also, Cayman uh, uh, Prep, if you guys go on to the Reef website and go to Grouper Moon Project, you can click on a section called uh, Drifter, Baby? Baby Grouper Adrift. Baby Grouper Adrift, and there's a bunch of information about the, that pro part of the project there that you can look at. Uh, does anyone else at Cayman Prep have a question for us? Excuse me, Paul. Yes. Uh, Kevin here. Hi, Kevin. Yes, uh, but my student was actually clarifying the question he was asking. Okay. Because we were reading that the female, is it the female that turns or changes into a male? So he wanted to know why this happens or how it happens, right? Right. And why it happens. Okay. So the question is um, uh, that they've read that some grouper or some fish can change from a uh, male to a female, which is true. And Christy and Bryce can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, actually, um, there, there are several different types of fishes that, that, uh, that do that. And usually that happens when, uh, when fish maintain a harem. In other words, when there's one large, big fish that's the male, and he guards a whole bunch of females, and he basically keeps that territory with all those females to himself. And so when the females get large enough so that they're becoming the big ones, those females have the ability to change into a male so that they can take over and, and guard a territory. Some grouper species do this, but not all of them. And it turns out Nassau grouper 
as near as we can tell, don't temp typically switch sexes. So they're either born as a male or a female, just like us, and they stay that way for the rest of their lives. But some grouper do switch. And it, it all has to do with how they ultimately reproduce. Because NASA grouper all get together in this big cloud, of, there's thousands and thousands of them, they're all releasing um, eggs at the same time. Nobody can maintain a harem there. Nobody can defend a bunch of female when you got 4,000 other big males around you. And so it doesn't make sense for them to, to switch sexes, and that's likely why Nassau grouper don't switch, switch sex. Uh, Bryce, is there a fish that they would know here in the Caribbean that does that often? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, if you've done... Uh, how many of you have gone snorkeling, gone out into the water? Have most of you guys dipped your head in the water? So if you if you've seen par or you've gone to the fish market or if you've seen parrotfish or wrasses any wrasses like blueheads or clown wrasse or even um uh, hogfish all of those species are sex changers they'll they'll start off as females and they'll end up as males when they get big enough to take over their own their own territory. All right, wonderful question, uh, Spot Bay. Let's go back to Cayman Prep. Uh, and see if you guys have a question. All right, looks like we've lost Cayman Prep. We'll come back to you guys. Um, we can take one more question from Spot Bay. Um, can the groupers ever lose track of that loss? Can you say that one more time? Can the groupers ever lose track and get lost? Excellent. So the question is, can the groupers ever lose track and get lost? Wonderful question. All right. Well, we know that they they do a lot of looking around. So maybe they're not lost always, but they don't always go directly to where they need to be. They will leave their home reef, and they may swim down to another spot first and check it out, or they may get to the spawning aggregation site, and then they'll leave and they'll go look at other places. And we think part of that is maybe that they're just looking around to make sure that they're at the best party, like Bryce was saying. But also, we think that part of that moving around that they're doing is helping other younger grouper know which way to go. So we, we think that they don't get lost very often, but we know that they, they move around a lot. They go a lot of places before they go and stay at the spawning site for, for their time. And you know what's a what's always a good way to not get lost is to go with a buddy, right? To go to go with a, a group of people, and grouper do that too. So when you see them out there swimming along the reef, all right, guys, we've just joined a Google. To get to their Cat, these site. are scientists in the Cayman Islands studying the grouper project. Hey, Denise, can you can you mute your camera for a moment? Anyway, the upshot is that they all go with their friends. You'll see them migrating in big groups of 20 to maybe even 50 grouper all up and down, up and down the uh, the reef as they're moving to and from that spawning site. And that's one of the ways they, they avoid getting lost. Um, also, guys, uh, if you uh, with Kevin read uh, Cooper Moon by Cindy Shaw, uh, you'll you'll hear uh, Cooper, the grouper, talking about seeing the other groupers heading off somewhere, and then he really feels strongly that he needs to join them. And and we think that it's that's something that's kind of like that. muted. All right. And now we can go back to Cayman Prep and see if you guys have any further questions for us. How far do the grouper travel to get to the aggregation sites? Like what kind of distances are they coming from? Can you say that one more time? Oh, okay. So the question is... Is it all like local from... Hey man. Yeah, so the question is, where, where are the fish coming from that show up at the spawning sites? Uh, here in the Caymans, we've done quite a bit of work to try yeah. and ask that question. Um, uh, there's actually two parts to it. One, one is not that surprising, because all Caymanian fish are from Cayman and nowhere else. Um, and in fact, they're not even moving between islands. We've, we've never had a documented case of a fish moving from, even from little Cayman to Brack. So, so all fish on islands only stay on the islands. They never go anywhere else. But what's really interesting is that 
On average, those fish are traveling something like 50 to 60 kilometers per spawning yeah. season, which is a lot, given that the island itself is only about 12 kilometers long. So on average, those fish are circling the island at least a few times before they decide to stop at one spot. Some of them are traveling upwards of 500 kilometers. So they're circling the island something like 15 times. So even though they're all local, they move a huge amount during that spawning season. And we wow. think in part that's because, as Christy was saying earlier, they're, they're cruising the reefs. They're looking for other individuals trying to figure out what's going on and find just that right party. All right. Excellent question, Cayman Prep. Um, I think that we are going to wrap up now because we're yeah. at the time. Um, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I uh, uh, want to remind you that tomorrow we're going to be doing uh, the show, the web, the webcast, again at the same time at 10 o'clock. Um, and I will send you guys all an invite again tomorrow. And we all hope that you guys can join us. Also, I'll send you a link to today's webcast. And you can watch this at home with your families anytime that you want, if you'd like to show them. And, uh, and yeah, we would like to thank you guys so much for joining. We'll say hi to Miss Denise as well in Miss Denise's class. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Oh, she got it.